Uh, like you said before, my name is Ronald Naharo, and I'm the Coalition's Director for the Libra Initiative in Nevada. Uh, as an organization, we strongly believe that the free enterprise and the free market system, which many of you in here today uh, work in and live it every day as small business owners, we strongly believe that it's the free enterprise system and our free markets that create the most opportunity for all folks from the bottom up. We need to empower individuals to achieve their own success on their own terms through their own hard work. And as an organization, uh, we believe that public policy uh, should focus on empowering and making sure that uh, their talents, their individual abilities are able to lead the way in the marketplace to create innovation, create jobs, and create opportunity. As a son of Salvadoran immigrants myself who came into this country very young, and had nothing else to do but work hard and start a business, I saw firsthand how the free enterprise system in this country can lead to the greatest opportunity for all people. That also includes a, an immigration policy that allows for these people to contribute, my people like myself and family members like myself, to have the opportunity to work hard and make themselves the best that they can be in this great country. Uh, so tonight it gives me great honor to introduce somebody whose inspirational story continues to inspire me Today, it's a man that I learned a lot from over the years. Uh, his, his, in just over a, a little more than a decade, he was able to go from working in the fields as a youngster, born of immigrant families, to working in the most powerful house in the world, the White House of the United States of America. He's somebody that hired me, so I have to say nice things about him. But. Uh, the kind of man that he is, 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 this will illustrate it perfectly. During my job interview with him, one of the first questions he asked me uh, didn't have to do with my ability, skills, or knowledge processes, but he asked me, what do you feel about being humble? That just shows you the kind of man that he is, so it gives me great honor to introduce to you a friend, the president, of, founder of the Libra Initiative, Mr. Daniel Garza, and just to give you a little preview of the inspirational story that I'm telling tonight, uh, I direct your attention up there to the video, and that pretty much sums up his American experience. So thank you very much for having us today. My name is Daniel Garza, and my American experience started off here. I grew up picking crops with my family. My parents were immigrants from Mexico with nothing but a fourth grade education. We were so poor. My siblings and I would often miss school to work in the fields. Our home was the size of a tool shed. It had no running water. And what we would do is warm buckets of water on the stove so that when my parents returned from work in the fields, uh, they would bathe uh, with small cups. My father never took welfare because he didn't want to depend on anyone or lose his dignity. He is a proud and noble man. He can make it with just three things. He's got good credit and freedom, liberty to work. And that's what the United States is. You know, I didn't know it at the time, but my father began saving money and buying and selling small properties. He bought a motel with the profit he made. My family and I spent long hours fixing up that motel while still working the fields. My father continued to buy and sell property, and one day he and my mother retired with enough money to live comfortably for the rest of their lives. If I don't come to the United States, I don't think I have the life that we got right now, living so good, you know. My parents' American dream had become a reality. My family and I have succeeded by following the path to freedom, but that path is on the verge of vanishing. What we're starting to see here in America now is a growth in the size and the scope of government that is now starting to look like the governments that we left behind. I'm just torn apart when I see folks who are caught in this um, dependency that government offers. And not only that, they've condemned their children to a life of mediocrity and subsistence. That this is not the American dream. This is an American nightmare. The Libre Initiative is reaching the Hispanic community before they are lost forever. We know advancing economic freedom is the best way to improve human well-being, especially those at the bottom. And that's our message to the world. 
You know, one day I was speaking before a group of 150 evangelical Hispanic ministers in South Texas, and a man stood up. He had tears in his eyes and said, you know, I've never heard these things before. Why has nobody told us? And most Hispanics have never even heard about economic freedom, but they know it. Cuba, Venezuela, Mexico, Hispanics leave countries that have been ruined by tyranny to come to America, the land of the free. They don't just believe in the cause, they've lived it. It is a privilege to live in the United States because this is a nation where you dictate your destiny. No other nation has fulfilled more dreams and more aspirations than this country. And to have been born here, uh, I'm just grateful to God for that. Learn how you can get involved at joindebit.org. to be addressing you, um, the Latin American Chamber of Business, uh, the Men's Republican uh, Group. Um, you're doing, I think, uh, extraordinary work, and um, we're proud to associate ourselves with you, and I want to thank Ronnie also for the, the great work he's doing here in, in Nevada. Um, the Libre Initiative um, has been around since June of 2011, and we are, have been very proud of the work that we've done across the country. Uh, during my time at the White House, uh, I remember uh, working at the Office of Public Liaison. Um, and it was concerning to me that when the president would call on me to, uh, to advance whatever the issue was, uh, that there was a, a, a very small group of Latino freedom-oriented uh, uh, organizations out in, across the country. And most of the Latino organizations, uh, Hispanic organizations, uh, were more of the progressive bent. Uh, either you know, unions, um, National Council of La Raza, LULAC, MALDEF, you know, th these kind of organizations uh, that frankly, um, and I've said this publicly and I'll say it again, uh, really were working against the things that we were trying to, to advance. Uh, to restrain and, and, and sort of reverse the centralization of so much power and money uh, flooding into Washington, D.C. Uh, we uh, have always believed in a limited government and small government. Um, as a conservative, it's always bothered me uh, that we give too much power, too much control to politicians, to bureaucrats over our lives. Um, and that they have been irresponsible with that power and with that control, and yet we see more and more power and more and more control. Um, it's, it's, it boggles the mind. Uh, I, I, you know, government that governs least governs best, Thomas Jefferson said, uh, and, and I stand by that. Uh, that we have to remain a government um, of the people, by the people, and for the people. Uh, to quote another founding father. Um, my parents came to America from, um, like Ronnie was talking about, uh, they were immigrants themselves. Um, my parents uh, were from Mexico, as you saw in the video, uh, Nuevo León, Mexico, uh, near the city of Monterrey, um, which is now, I think, a, a bursting metropolis of about five million people. Um, at the time, uh, my parents uh, lived about a half hour away from Monterrey, a small little um, provincial town um, th whose name is Garza Gonzalez, Nuevo León, uh, near Los Ramones, in Nuevo León. Anyways, the point is, um, they saw America as the promised land back in the 50s, actually, when my parents came. And um, dad and mom married in, in 64, and um, they were going to make their lives here in America. Dad loved America. Dad loves America. <laughs> Um, there is no greater country in the world, um, Dad would tell me. Um, he saw it very much like um, Woody Guthrie um, described it in a song that he wrote about the Jodes uh, from the Grapes of Wrath. Um, in one of the stanzas, um, the Jode family, I think, of the song, it, uh, he sings uh, something like, and they came to the mountaintop. It was a rich green valley with a river running through it. There was work for every single hand, they thought. There was work for every single hand. And dad and mom came to California uh, to work the fields, uh, pick grapes, moved to, I was born in, in Central Valley of California in Danuba. 
That mom worked hard. They were hard workers. Um, they moved to the state of Washington, really where I was raised, in the Yakima Valley, uh, they, where they picked apples, pears, peaches, did everything under the sun. Um, dad, dad and mom had a vision. They were going to work hard, do the sacrifices that they needed to do to make life better for their children. And in doing that, um, about 20 years of working in the fields, and suffering the indignations and suffering the, the elements and you know, everything under the sun, uh, they uh, saved up enough money to buy uh, that hotel that you saw in the, in the video. And it was, it was tough at first. Um, that small hotel that they had, um, you know, for a while there we weren't making it and so we had to continue working in the fields, my, my older brother and I, with my father to make ends meet. And dad had to borrow money from his sister who, who was you know, well off. Um, and so it was hard going there for a while. And they poured some money into the hotel, invested you know, uh, in, in new furniture and painted the whole thing and new rugs and whatever. And um, pretty soon the clientele started pouring in. And there, there was a, a, like a, a moment in time where you know, things had turned and, and we were on our way. Entered the middle class, I was able to go off to college, um, become a police officer. Uh, and this was, this was to me the realization of the American dream. And throughout the arc of history of America, over 200 immigrants have come to America and have realized their dreams. No country in the world has fulfilled more dreams than this country has. Um, it, it is an, a remarkable country, just a remarkable country. Latinos in America, uh, we're what, 57, 58 million or so, are interdependent with the rest of, of, of America. To have a thriving Latino community, we need a thriving America. To have a thriving America, you need a thriving Latino community. We, we are interdependent. We need each other. We need each other. And um, we have to respect each other, too. Uh, it just goes both ways. Uh, and my parents taught me that. You know, Ronnie, um, to his credit, remembered the question that I, humility to me is, is such a big deal. It's such a powerful virtue in a human being. Um, and I saw that, that nobility, that humility in my parents. And um, it, it, to me, it, 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 it gives me deeper, richer respect for somebody who has humility. Because humility it really is an act of gratitude. That you recognize that wherever you're at, whatever you've achieved, that you, you didn't do it on your own. That somebody helped you get there. And, and, and that humility is a recognition of that. that. That my parents helped me get to where I'm at. That, that you know, maybe that, that other kid who was maybe brighter than I was, maybe it was smarter than I was, but they didn't have those parents. They didn't have that one teacher. Or they didn't have that pastor or that mentor who opened doors for him or her. And I'm grateful that I did, that I got the breaks, and somebody else maybe didn't. And, and, and that gives me a humility uh, that I saw in my parents and, and that I, I hope to God that I'll never lose. Um, my, my parents were, were, were fine Christian people, are Christian people, um, who, who, who serve God, who, who have passed on to me their values. Uh, and I, I hope that we've been able to reflect that in, in the Libre Initiative. Uh, in the work that we do. Latinos today, th there are 15 million of us who make over $50,000 a year. And that's just a start. We are the richest, the wealthiest Latinos in the world. There is no other country, Argentina or Spain or Mexico, richer, wealthier in all their totality than the Latinos of America. That, that, that's a powerful thing because, again, it is prima facie evidence on its face that America still is that country that can fulfill those dreams. 
But we can only remain that country if we defend our economic freedoms. If we reverse, again, that imposition of, of so much government, of so much taxation, of so, many, so much rule and regulation, um, every rule, every statute, every ordinance that is passed, even at the local uh, uh, county, state, and federal level, really is a politician trying to change our behavior. And you can only do so much of it before you, you begin to impede some of that, um, that prosperity that I'm talking about. My parents are now part of the 1% most wealthiest people in the world because of America. Now, here's the thing about that. According to the World Bank, if you make over $36,000 a year, you too are part of the richest 1% people in the world. Think about that. We're 5% of the world's population, but half of the 1% most wealthiest people in the world reside here in America. We are 5% of the world's population, but 33% we, we, but of the world's millionaires live here in America. And this is the powerful thing about having that many millionaires in America. 86% of them are self-made. They didn't inherit their wealth. They generated that wealth by providing a product or a service that made our lives better. And we responded by buying their product or their service and made them wealthy. And they, in turn, took that wealth and reinvested it into their companies or into their small businesses and created jobs, opportunity for the rest of us, like my parents did. And that's the beautiful thing about economic freedom, the ability to accumulate wealth and pass it on to your children, to make your life better and to make the lives of your children better. That's a damn good thing. And I don't know why we're having to defend capitalism in America today. It boggles the mind, really. It just frustrates the heck out of me. Um, of what's going on with, with, with the other side of the political spectrum, um, that they would grow the imposition of government, that they would actually want to hinder progress like that. Right now, there's a raging debate uh, on tax reform, needed tax reform. I talked about what's happening here in, 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 in Reno, and, and, and uh, obviously, you guys have industry, you also have the casino business, tourism is a big deal. Um, tax reform could actually speed up the process of prosperity and, and economic growth here in Reno, create more jobs for those who are the most vulnerable. It, you know, what, one of the things, I, I talked about you know, how, how my parents had it rough at, at the start. I'm not gonna mince words. Capitalism sometimes will kick you in the teeth. You will fail. You will fail more times than not, actually, under, under, the, under our free market system. There's, a, there's an interesting statistic um, about, about that. It says more than 70% of family businesses do not survive to be passed on to the next generation, and 90% don't make it to the generation after that. And the tax code has a lot to do with that. So, so when you have a successful, thriving business, um, we should salute that business. We should celebrate that. Instead, sometimes the left almost seems resentful that we have successful businesses. Again, it just sort of boggles the mind. Um, we are talking about um, that on average, the house plan, on average, would save a family of four, would put $1,200 back in the pockets of folks. Money that they need. And some people are scraping by, paycheck to paycheck. And I know that there's, there's a lot of folks on the left who, 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 who sort of, almost with disdain, look down on $1,200. $1,200 is a lot of money. I was, I was, um, was going to talk at an immigration panel in Texas, in Dallas, and I was being introduced by the host. This is about a couple of years ago. 
And the person that I was going to debate on the other side was Janet Murguia from National Council of La Raza. Um, and the host in, gave her an introduction and, 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 and celebrated her. And, you know, um, and look, uh, Janet is, I, I respect her tremendously, and, and she has achieved a lot of things. But she turned to me and she said, oh, and by the way, this is Daniel Garza. He's the executive director of the Libre Initiative, and they give out turkeys for votes. And, and she meant it as a joke, I guess, um, because we do. We give out turkeys on Thanksgiving as part of the community work that we do. And yeah, I didn't take it too well because I thought she was mocking us. And, and uh, as soon as I got up to the mic, I said, you know, Betty, that was her name, the reason we give out turkeys is because people can't afford them. They're struggling. And you can make fun of it. But you know, this is real need out there. There's something about the free market system that us as conservatives need to understand too. You know, yes, we talk about we should resist redistribution of wealth, and we should. Uh, Abraham Lincoln said, a short man doesn't become any taller by cutting the legs off a giant. It doesn't work that way. What we should focus on is redistribution of knowledge and equal opportunity. And what I, what I want to talk about here is that sometimes people have a rougher time of moving up that economic ladder because they are cut off from the market system. They don't have the equal opportunity or the equal access that maybe you and I had. And at the Libre Initiative, we try to remove those barriers. What am I talking about? In the Latino community, 30% of Latino adults do not have a high school diploma. That you think about that. 30% do not have a high school diploma. That is a major barrier to opportunity. It keeps you from getting a job, a fine paying job. And, and you have to hustle that much harder and you have to work that much harder, and maybe even hold two jobs. Yeah, I talked about, you know, that after the hotel did well, right before that time, I, I got called into my high school counselor's office, Ms. Diaz, and she said, you know, kid, when you're here, you actually show potential, but I gotta tell you, we have an issue with you gone every other day working in the fields with your parents and then going to Nebraska to work in the sugar beets two months out of the year and then leaving to Mexico for three months out of the year. So I'm here to tell you that if you go back to Mexico this year, you will not pass to the 11th grade. And I said, well, Ms. Diaz, I don't get to decide whether I go to work or not. I don't get to decide whether I go to Mexico or not or Nebraska or not. And so I asked a very fundamental question. I said, what happens next year when I, don't, when I do the same thing? He says, well, you're going to have to repeat the 11th grade over and over again. That was my last day of school. I'm a high school dropout. This was a public school system that wouldn't accommodate to someone like me. Now, you can make judgment on my parents, but that was my reality. That was our reality. We had work. Somehow, some way, we had to put food on the table and make ends meet and pay those bills. But something happens when, when, you, when you put your life in, in the hands of our almighty God. Um, I, I caught a break. I had an uncle who, who begged me and paid for me to go and get my GED. And I passed it. And getting that GED gave me a second chance. I'm a big believer in second chances, in giving people second chances. And when 30% of Latino adults don't have a high school diploma, we need to work hard to, to, to address that. 33% of Latinos speak only Spanish. That is a major hindrance to opportunity. There was a study done by the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, NALEO, and they said, that when an immigrant learns English, they will quadruple their lifetime earning in their lives. Now think about that, that's transformative. That English is the language of success and we should get on with the business of teaching English like right away. No ifs, ands, or buts. 
And so in Miami, in Orlando, in San Antonio, in, in Phoenix, uh, we're going to start here. Um, thousands have learned English th through, through the programs that, that, that we offer because it changes lives. It removes that barrier for people. They can get a better job. There's a, a, a guy it, it, right now who's going through our class, our English classes in Orlando. The Disney Corporation is waiting to give him a management position that pays him $35 an hour. And he's making 15 right now. And as soon as he gets that certification, he's on his way. He'll get that management position. That changes lives. And, and we're doing that work across the country. It's important work. In some states, 50% of Latinos do not have a driver's license. That, to me, is astonishing. Things that we do, that we take for granted, drive our kids to school, go visit grandma, or go to the store, or whatever, um, a lot of Latinos do it with fear. We learned here in, in Las Vegas, uh, uh, Ronnie will tell you, that um, over 75% of Latinos who were taking the driver's license test were failing the test. I don't know why, but they were. And, and this was causing, obviously, um, a, a major barrier in our community. And so we set up a class, uh, Ronnie will remember, it was at a flea market. Is it, are we still doing it in the same place? Yeah. We're still doing it. It was a flea market. <laughs> at a swap meet, and it, it was, it was the, the best of circumstances because he had this major space in the middle of this bodega or a warehouse or something where he kept his, his swap meet, uh, this open area in the middle. And, and, we, and we partnered up with Fox Latino, Mundo Fox, and we invited Latinos who were having a tough time getting their driver's license to come on, come on over that day and we would have an expert teaching classes on passing the driver's license test. We had 500 people show up that day. We've had, I don't know how many since then. Close to 1,500. Thank you. And we did our, uh, a study where it showed that over 80% of the folks that were taking that, 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 uh, that training were now getting their driver's license. And that's a remarkable turnaround. And, and it, it didn't cost us anything. It was just working with, you know, uh, with partners, collaborating, um, like, we, like we do with you folks. Uh, there's a synergy there. There's something we can do to lift people, the most vulnerable, and make our society and our communities better, and make them prosper, and give them access to the marketplace. And all of a sudden, you realize that for thousands and thousands of Latinos across the country, the free market becomes something real to them something to defend, something that they hadn't even considered before that needed defending. You see, the thing about 200 million immigrants who have come to America and made their life better, that only works when you have an economic system that accommodates for them and allows them to generate their own wealth and then create opportunities for others. And we've done that through, our, through our, the history of this country, and we need to be able to continue to do that. But when government grows, when government draws too much, when government hinders too much, and all of a sudden it turns out you wake up one day and you're actually working to fulfill the aspirations of politicians, to fulfill their dreams. Not your dreams, not our dreams, not my dreams, but for Nancy Pelosi. Or, or whoever, you know, the Republicans or Democrats, I don't care. I don't want to fulfill your dreams, my man. I want to fulfill mine. And the thing about that is, in that, that rugged American individualism, that when you go out there, when you strike out on your own, and you generate that product or that service that creates customer demand, you're creating commerce and industry, and, and you're generating wealth is what you're doing. And government should get out of the way. But it just seems to want to take credit for everything. It just seems to want to promise more and more to more and more people, more and more programs, more and more dependency, so they can beat their chest and see what I've done, see what I can do for you. 
uh, thank you, I can do it on, a, on my own. And my parents showed me that. We can do, we have the skills and the talents. Wealth is generated in the private sector, not because of government. And yes, government is instituted for certain things that are enumerated in our constitution, but they're minimal. I, you know, as, 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 as American citizens, you know, we, we need to do more reflection on that. And, and I think we need to be much more assertive on reclaiming that freedom. At the Libre Initiative, we believe that freedom drives progress. The freer we are, the more progress we're going to generate. I mean, you take a look at what's happening in Venezuela right now. Government is almighty, and they have destroyed the wealth of that country. They have decimated the lives of millions of families in Venezuela, and they are fleeing Venezuela. They're starting to restrict um, exits from, from Venezuela. Um, that, that, of course, that, that shows you what, what, what uh, an almighty government can do. And we've seen it throughout the arc of history. And so, and so we, we're, we're very committed uh, to driving an agenda, again, um, that is going to make that is going to put a focus on the private sector, that is going to put a focus on the individual, that is going to reverse uh, that power and that control from, from Washington and bring it back to the people. And um, we're proud to be a partner with you on, on the community work that we're doing as well. Uh, and I would invite you to join us and be a part of what we're trying to do in the Latino community. And, and I would just uh, end um, by saying this... Um, Focus really quick on, on, this, on this tax reform. Um, the, the tax cuts that they're talking about. There's a narrative out there um, that they're doing this for the rich. Um, this class warfare um, that I think is destroying America. Uh, we need to move beyond that. There needs to be tax cuts at every level. There needs to be a, a um, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to make taxes as low and as flat as possible for all levels of our society. And that's important because wealth, if it, it, it you know, they, they talk about this trickle down uh, um, economics, that, that's a false narrative. And if we focus on a trickle down economy, it is the ruination of America. We cannot have a system that has a trickle-down effect. Wealth has to permeate. Wealth has to saturate all levels of the society. It has to be from the top down, from the, down, from down, from the bottom up. It has to be from the middle out and from out into the middle, permeating all society. And when, and when we uh, reduce those tax rates at every level, that's exactly what happens. And we know that's what happens because historically, that's what we have seen. Under Kennedy, we had a GDP growth of 5.2% after the tax cuts. We had 9.3 million new jobs after the tax cuts. Disposable income went up 2,243. And here's the thing about that. Revenue into the federal uh, government went up 283 billion under, under Jack Kennedy because of those tax cuts that he instituted. A rising tide lifts all boats. He was absolutely right about that when he said it. Under Reagan, 400 billion of new revenue after the tax cuts and a 5% GDP growth as a result of those tax cuts. And we had 11.7 million new jobs under Reagan after the tax cuts. Even under Bush, we had 6.9 million new jobs after those tax cuts, and revenue went up 227 million. Folks, it's the spending that is killing us. They are spending much more than what's going into the, into the, uh, uh, the Treasury. It, it's not that, this is, uh, that um, our tax system is not generating growth. It is. And, it's, and, and a tax cut would actually increase revenues into the Treasury. We just need to restrain that spending. And to do that, we have to restrain the politicians. Uh, well, of course, with the folks who are running, notwithstanding. <laughs> <laughs>
I know they're going to be fine conservatives. We're going to go and, and, uh, and limit spending and be responsible about that. At least that, that is, that is our, our hope. Um, and one of the last things I'll say is that we're also proud of the work that we're doing in actually connecting the Latino community to elected officials. Um, here in Nevada, uh, in Las Vegas, actually during the presidential, we had a, a policy forum with Jeb Bush, with Rand Paul, Marco Rubio. We'll be holding one with Dean Heller on the second. Uh, and I, 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 I've been hosting those, those policy forums uh, in Vegas and, and they've been terrific. And, and I'm proud to, to be able to educate the Latino community on, on the important kind of policies that are actually making a difference in our community. Thank you very much. Before we have question and answers, which we want you to come up here to the mic one at a time, May Herbert, which is the founder of Ambassadors of Goodwill has a little thank you for Daniel. May? Oh, terrific. Okay, now here. This is Air Force Academy graduate, a Naval Academy graduate, my children. Wow. So I always give the souvenir to them. Thank you, these the, are beautiful. Uh, thank you so much, yeah. I appreciate that. Okay. Outstanding, thank you. Tomorrow. By the way, May also got a recent letter from the White House. <laughs> Never mind, she's going to be Thank quiet. So she's got more pictures of presidents and vice presidents and secretary of states in her house, the whole house covered with... Yeah, never mind. Yeah, Thank she's being mild. Anyway, let's start Q&A for Daniel. Come on, don't be shy. One at a time. Come on. <laughs> I know you have questions. Well, here, uh, she, it's hard for her to well, we just turn yeah. the mic over. Yeah, take yeah. the, yeah. It's going to be easier for people. You did a great job. Thank you, sir. <laughs> there we go. You sure? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I found I oh <laughs> I found your 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 uh, talking very interesting. Thank you. My father came over here in early 1900s. Well, he came to Canada, and he didn't have had the skills of language. He he fortunately was the son of a father who had a building in building going on in, in, in Holland. And it, it, it sounded good to, to me to hear you talk about all the help that your people got. My dad only had his occupation. That was it. Yeah. So, and that's interesting because uh, my parents uh, didn't speak English, didn't have a driver's license, didn't have a high school diploma, and yet, uh, they did very, very well, right? Because they weren't afraid of hard work. They were resourceful. That generation was just an amazing generation. Um, they, they found a way, right? And um, we need to be like that too, right? That rugged individualism. Uh, rugged individualism. And, and when, when I talk about the kind of community services that we're providing, what we're, what we're aiming to do is just accelerate that process of moving on and up that, the economic ladder. If my parents took 20 years, maybe we can help somebody do it in five uh, because now they have these tools, because they are now better positioned in the marketplace, because now they bring value to their employers with their English, with their driver's license, you know, with, with all these assets and these tools. So if we can improve on somebody's comparative advantage in the marketplace, and that's what it's all about. If, if we can um, develop that skill, that talent, um, why not? You know, it, it, it just changes lives. It improves the lives of people. And it makes our communities better. And it makes us richer. So uh, we're very committed to that. And, and uh, with all, all due respect to the generations who came before us who had it tougher and, and, and were incredibly resilient and successful. So I have a question. Are you still going to be involved at the White House with Trump? Were you there under Obama? And how are you funded? 
God know I wasn't there during Obama. <laughs> I was uh, actually, I was uh, at the Office of Public Liaison at the White House under the Bush administration. Um, and so um, th th there were conversations, uh, there were offers uh, with the Trump administration. But um, I have a family of three kids living in McAllen, Texas. They moved from the state of Washington with me to, to Washington, D.C. And then, then they moved with me to Miami when I worked for Televisa and Univision. And then, we, then they moved uh, to Texas with me uh, doing the Libra. They're tired, and I don't want to do that to them. And, uh, and I, I love what I'm doing now. I think we're making a difference nationwide. We operate in 10 states. We have about 70 employees um, full time and uh, over almost 20,000 enlisted volunteers who are doing amazing work here in Reno and, and, and in Las Vegas as well. Uh, we've done over five million phone calls and visited over almost a million, or um, I'm sorry, 200,000 homes, um, Latinos. And, and, and that's important. Um, you know, data also is, has, uh, in this digital society, has, has made us uh, much more effective uh, in the kind of outreach that we do. Look, um, we do community work. But we don't apologize for driving an agenda too and getting involved uh, with public policy. And we have even done, done some endorsements during the campaign cycle. Uh, so we mobilize Latinos around candidates that we feel are gonna drive pro-freedom issues. And we mobilize and lobby on public policy that we feel is gonna make America stronger and better. And our volunteers are key to that. And I've been you know, just so proud to be, to be at the tip of the spear on that and, and continue to do that kind of work. Hi, Daniel. I want you to speak, if you would, to the um, things that have, you've done in our part of the state. I know that Las Vegas has been very active. And personally, I know what's going on in, in the north, but I'm not sure everybody in the room does. We've worked very closely with uh, Libre Organization and AFP. So uh, Amer Americans for Prosperity is our big brother. Um, we, we work hand in hand with them. We are fully aligned with what Americans for Prosperity does, uh, Concerned Veterans for America, Generation Opportunity. Uh, we are the sister organization to, to, to those organizations. Um, in Nevada, we, look, I talked about um, my education, or, or lack thereof, or the stunt in it. Um, school choice for us has, has been a very important issue. Uh, and here in Nevada, I know there's been progress and movement on, on uh, ESAs, uh, on vouchers. Um, when parents are given choices, that's important. They get to dictate the future of their children. Again, not a politician, not a bureaucrat, not some union syndicate, but the parents have the power to, to remove their children from a system that, that is not serving the needs of their child and putting them in, in a system that is, gonna be, that is gonna equate to success for their children. Um, I got a second chance, but a lot of folks haven't got that second chance. And, and for me, I, school choice is, is, is critical because it, it, it allows flexibility. There, are, there is now a different option. If your child is headed down a direction that you almost know for certain they're gonna fail, and you can do something about it, Using the same tax money, why not? If they can improve the, the, the direction that their child is on, we should do everything possible to make that happen. And so we've mobilized Latinos uh, from, from uh, Nevada um, uh, to, to, to uh, get behind uh, the ESAs, to get behind a system that, that is gonna empower the parents. Over 75% of Latino parents are in support of, of school choice programs. It's a big deal to us. Uh, John F. Kennedy said that our progress in America can only be as speedy as our progress in education. And if we don't show, I mean, if we're doing the same thing over and over again, uh, you know, uh, we're going to beat our head against the wall. So, so it's been important for us to not only educate and inform the Latino community on issues like tax reform, on limited government, um, uh, even on immigration reform, 
uh, but on an issue like school choice and, 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 and get them behind it and engage them on that issue and mobilize them on, ar around those issues. Uh, and they've learned a lot and I think they've become more active. They've, they've gained a new consciousness about these kind of issues. And I think they've, they, they have um, felt that empowerment uh, so that then they can advocate you know, for, for issues that we feel are gonna, gonna restrain government, restrain the politicians, and, and, and return power back to the people. Hi, uh, my name's Eddie Lorton, and we're at a Republican event, and I would like to address the elephant in the room, and that would be, how do you feel about this on the language barrier and the legal licenses? How do you feel about people being legal here, too? So I was wondering how you felt about that. Yeah. Thanks. So as far as I'm concerned, um, the political decision has been made, and if there's an opportunity to uh, help somebody improve their lives, we're not gonna ask their status. Um, I'll let the politicians figure out whether you'll allow a driver's license or not. And, and, and once that decision's been made, then uh, the law's the law. Um, and, and, and folks in Nevada can advocate for it or against it. Uh, I'm from Texas, so I'm, I'm not gonna butt in. <laughs> you know, um, so, so we feel strongly that public policy should be advanced to allow people to thrive. People to thrive. Um, and, and, and let me say something entre parentheses on that, um, that, that I think is important. I think it's a cruel irony that the indigenous people of the Americas, who used to roam the Americas for thousands of years, um, that the state comes and puts borders. And for the most part, it's been mostly the non-indigenous people who get to travel freely, who go to and from any country they want for business, for pleasure, for whatever reason. And mostly it's the indigenous people who we say, don't go any further, you stay there. Um, there's a cruel irony to that. Now, you know, we can get into the politics of immigration, and, and I'm actually not an open borders guy, and, and, and I actually have very conservative views on immigration. But I want to be considerate of that also, uh, of the mindset of the immigrant who comes to America and risks their lives seeking opportunity to come and work hard. You know, Charles Koch, who I admire very much, has a great line on that one, and he says, we should be working to allow anybody who wants to come to America uh, to, to make it better, who make us stronger, and keep out those who would come to exploit our, our system or come and do us harm. And, and, and in a very real way, you know, um, our immigration system right now doesn't allow for that flexibility or for that accommodation. The 1986 uh, Immigration Act only uh, absorbed the three million that at the time were here legally, but didn't, didn't allow further um, accommodation for market forces. So I, I, you know, we have to address that. And, and you can't, I think, have a dynamic society or a dynamic economy without addressing that issue. So. Okay, hi, I'm Maria Davis, and my question is, um, having said what you just said about supporting uh, those who came to work hard and make this country better, mm -hmm. we know that that is the case for most of the immigrants that are here. Of course, there's always gonna be those bad apples that will make everybody else look bad in the basket. Mm -hmm. But so do you guys support the Dreamers, for instance? Do you do anything to support that? And yes. So, so for us, it's, 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 it's very clear um, that um, these kids did not decide to come to America. They were brought here. They didn't make the decision to come or not. They were brought here by their parents. And the p parents were the ones who intentionally violated the law, seeking opportunity. The vast majority of them. There are bad apples, like there is in any group, right? Um, and, and, and I think we should focus our resources on, in, in filtering out those bad apples. Um, but yeah, we are for in favor of dreamer legislation that would uh, legalize the status of these kids and 
we believe strongly that we should get on with the business of assimilating them as quick as possible into the American system so that they become full contributing members of our society. Otherwise, the status quo of keep, keeping these kids in the shadows, out of school, away from a college degree, and out of work does nothing to help our society. Uh, and, and so we, we, we are very strongly for a, a dreamer legislation. Hi, uh, my name is Kieran. Um, we met before. I was all, all the uh, statistics you brought up before of, of um, uh, Hispanic families, business owners being pro freedom, and all these um, the ESAs. Is there any outreach that you're doing to get uh, Hispanics to run for office, pro freedom, conservative Hispanics to run for office? Because it seems like at the at the voting level, there's a lot of a lot more Hispanic, conservative, pro freedom Hispanics yeah. than there are. Yeah, that's a great question. Candidates. Look, I mean, look, um, our priority is not that a Latino wins this or a Latino wins that. Uh, we want to see freedom minded candidates, period, win election. Um, so here, and, and, and this is interesting, and I'm glad you raised this question. Uh, a lot of folks think, and may, maybe are even against immigration reform, uh, because they fear that they will automatically create this massive voting block of new Democrats. Uh, and I'm not trying to be partisan here, I'm, I'm just gonna state facts here. Uh, the Latino vote is not baked in, as many people think it is. It, in Colorado, in Colorado, you had a state that Barack Obama won in 2008 by 65% of the Latino vote. In 2012, he won it by 85% of the Latino vote. Michael Bennett won 90% of the Latino vote in Colorado. A, a Democrat um, running for Senate. One election with 90% of the Latino vote. And they said, oh my God, you know, that, that, that's it. You know, the, we've lost the, the, the Latino voter. Cory Gardner, a Republican runs for Senate two years later and goes all out and engages Latinos on issues of the economy, on education, on health care, on national security issues, issues that matter to Latinos, and of course immigration. He won 45% of the Latino vote in Colorado. Now that's a dramatic turnaround. So heck no, it's not baked in. You had, check this out, this is like the crown jewel of 2014 for Republicans, if, if you want to uh, take a look at the Latino vote. You had a black Republican challenger in District 23 of San Antonio in Texas who took on a Latino Democrat incumbent in a district with 75% Latinos and the black Republican challenger won, Will Hurd. That's astonishing, and that shows the maturity of the Latino voter. And, and it wasn't only, the, you know, it's like, well, you're sherry picking. Look, Brownback and Roberts got 45% of the Latino vote in Kansas. Purdue and Deal got over 45% each in, in Georgia. In Texas, Greg Abbott got 44% of the Latino vote and one Latino males in Texas. Cornyn got 52% of the Latino vote. All of it. So, so th th there, there is, so, so here's the thing, we can't be afraid to do the hard work. As conservative, free market-minded folks, we need to engage. We need to mobilize Latinos. We need to earn their vote and, and, and get them also to do the advocacy as well. But for some reason, a lot of us just have this fear of the, of the Latino voter. It doesn't have to be that way. They are conservatives. More Latinos self-identify as conservatives than they do as liberal, according to the NBC Marist poll and the Pew Hispanic poll. That's a fact. But we have to do the hard work. That's the thing, and it's the engagement that you're talking about that, that we have been driving across this country. Hi, Daniel. My name is Myrna Ayala, and I have a question. Um, I have been involved in the insurance industry for almost 14 years now, 
And you talk about driver license. As you know, in this part of Nevada, they're offering the driver license. However, there is a lot of the Hispanic community that is not applying for the license because they're scared or you know you, they get the wrong information. I was wondering if you um, if you have any any um, services that will help these people get educated to pass the test. So uh, yeah, I talked about uh, what we're doing in Las Vegas, and we're going to continue that work. Um, but specifically about, um, you know, with the insurance issues and things, you know, that, that's another issue that I, I don't know if we've considered, Ronnie, I don't know if we're doing some work on, in that area, educating them on the need for insurance and... Yeah, so, so like I said, I mean, we're doing what we can on, on, on helping people, marrying the expert with, with the community, and, 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 uh, and educating them as much as possible on taking that driver's, li uh, driver's license exam. So, you know, obviously we have limited resources. And we, you know, we like to see that multiplied, you know, if other organizations got involved. Um, but we can only do so much, right, you know, given the limited resource. But we're going to continue that. And we, we are fully committed uh, to, to uh, and, and look, folks, um, there's actually a benefit to doing that work, too. A lot of the volunteers that we have are as a result of, of, of uh, folks who receive that benefit. Um, there is a trust that we've built in the community. We have a strong reputation. We have a position in the community that I think is important and has, has come as a result, I think, of the real work that we're doing in the communities with driver's licenses, uh, with English, um, giving away food, uh, toys, school supplies. Uh, we do uh, health checkups, uh, citizenship courses as well, get, them, you know, get folks you know, to, to citizenship. All this has been very important in building that rapport and that bond with the community. Um, and it's been critical. And, and look, um, the, I think it's important that we do that kind of work and that we show a different face than that I think, you know, that the left likes to project that conservatives are these cruel, minority-hating people. Nothing could be further from the truth. But, but so, you know, sometimes, you know, I don't think we address that, you know, assertive enough. Um, if they come after me, I mean, we are, we're super aggressive on hitting back on that. Uh, I mean, I, I am proud to be a Hispanic. And I, I um, my parents, I, I don't hold anybody above my parents. Uh, and the things they taught me and, and my culture, I'm proud of it. But I'm also deeply, deeply proud to be an American. Um, and, and, and those things are not mutually exclusive. So, so I think as conservatives, I think you know, we, we, we uh, sometimes make the mistake of, of staying away from minority communities. And I think we paid a heavy price because of that. One last question. Hello, Daniel. My name is Alex Lopez. Alex. Um, my question is, what is the projected, um, what would you call it, initiative for the people in Northern Nevada to create the value that you speak of? Um, because, you know, Northern Nevada has had these industries like Switch, Tesla, Google, Amazon, yeah. and so, these companies are relocating a lot of other people from a lot of other cities. So the Northern Nevada people, you could say the citizens of Northern Nevada, are being left out from being involved within these certain um, companies. So we're absorbing a bunch of other people from the surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. And the North and the East and the West and the South are all different. Yeah, so go. what is the projected? So w one of the major disadvantages that we have is that uh, we operate fully on the contributions of donors. We don't take one single cent of federal, state, or local dollars. Um, it's, it's our own money. The disadvantage is that, of course, you know, we, we, we don't get the millions that National Council of La Raza gets from the federal government to do their work. Um, and so we have limited resources. And I would love nothing more than to expand our, our work uh, that we do here in Reno uh, or in Northern Nevada. <clears throat> um, but w we have been growing, and, and I'm, I'm optimistic. I think that we're going to expand our operations in Reno. I know working with Americans for Prosperity, we went through a merger as well. And we've been able to leverage, I think, our assets and the, and, and, uh, the staff and, and the talent and the, and the pool of folks and the volunteers that we have. 
So we, we fully aim to expand the work that we're doing here and, and hopefully bring a lot of those community services to, to Reno that I think would help people develop those skills and those talents and again position them better as, as a, a labor supply for the, those companies that, that, that you're talking about. So I, 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 I'm, like I said, I'm optimistic and I hope we can do that uh, real soon. Daniel, we appreciate it. You're very informative. Thank you. Appreciate it. In the whole, in the, he'll state to answer some questions. Either Ronnie or Daniel have had their dinner yet, so you can talk to them while they're eating. However, there's a few things we have to do. Just a little house cleaning. I want to thank everybody for coming. I hope the idea is this, is to bring various groups together different backgrounds, I happen to be Portuguese, so anyway, different backgrounds to share our experiences and to go forward from there. Anyway, the people selling the tickets for the Veterans Guest House will be here and pass out literature. Pat will still be here, but before we do anything, we're going to do the drawing for the 50-50. Hi, this is Bill, and thank you for watching. Go ahead and, if you're not signed in, sign into your Gmail, go right up here and subscribe to RMC TV, and go over here, watch a couple more videos, link to our website at republicanmensclub.org, and finally, make sure you go down and leave a comment. The comments really help. See you on the next video.